Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we will be investigating the principles of static equilibrium, uh, looking at the basic principles from a theoretical perspective, and also seeing for a, that for a structure to be in equilibrium, each and every piece of it must also be in equilibrium. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as the method of sections, and we will see it. Uh, we will see this uh, both global equilibrium, go, uh, global equilibrium, referring to an, the equilibrium of an entire structure, as well as equilibrium of single pe isolated pieces of it. And we will see this both in principle and in example. So let us consider static equilibrium. So this comes right out of Newton's laws, Newton's second law. And Newton's second law states that the sum of forces on a body is proportional to its mass times its acceleration. And we could express this as, an equation, as a scalar equation like this if we're dealing with a very simple system, or we could just express it as a vector equation as well. Now, for static equilibrium, for the case of statics, structures that are uh, ideally not moving, we set this side of the equation equal to zero and say the sum of forces on a structure, the sum of force vectors, will equal to zero. And this is just applying uh, essentially balance of forces and conservation of linear momentum is what ultimately a lot of this is based on if you drill into the physics, but that's neither here nor there. So for any body, um, for any body in two-dimensional or three-dimensional space, there's going to be a balance of forces and in turn, also a balance of moments necessary to keep it in equilibrium. And also we could say in terms of, uh, in terms of dynamics, if we were looking at this in terms of dynamics, the rotational equivalent of this uh, equation would be the sum of moments on an object is equal to I, the, the polar moment of inertia, times an acceleration alpha. You'd have, uh, if you wanted to, you can run this in dynamics, the, uh, you can run, um, or uh, if you're running the balance of forces and moments in dynamics, you'll have an angular acceleration along with your linear acceleration. But that's neither here nor there. The important thing is when we're dealing with a static system, we also set this uh, side of the equation equal to zero. And then in statics, the sum of all forces on a body is equal to the sum of all moments on a body or simply zero. Uh, now, uh, technically, this doesn't mean that the object is not moving. Technically, that simply means that it's not accelerating, although that's getting a bit technical and something we don't really need to worry about. That's more a physics question than an engineering question. And of course, we could get into the fact that even nothing on the Earth's surface can ever be stationary. The Earth itself is moving, the Earth is rotating, the Sun is moving, and anyway, that's neither here nor there. So, for static equilibrium, what is important? For an object to be in static equilibrium, Let's break this down and look at it from the point of view of, say, rectangular coordinates. So let's say you have an object, again, just kind of a potato body like we drew previously, and we can apply a variety of forces to it. So say we have this potato body and we have some arbitrary forces applied to it, maybe F1, F2, F3, etc just some arbitrary forces acting in completely arbitrary directions. Uh, maybe an F4, whatever you want to call it. And each of these forces, because these forces don't pass directly through the center of mass, each of these forces is going to induce a, a tendency to translate, which is your translational force, or a tendency to rotate. And, well, actually, and, because there's no, uh, because none of these, okay, backing up. <laughs> uh, all forces, regardless of where they're placed, will create a tendency to for the body to translate. Uh, and then depending how they're placed and how far they are from the center of mass, they will also produce a tendency for the body to rotate. The only way no tendency to rotate will be produced by a force is if that force's line of action goes directly through the object's center of mass or centroid. Now, that's all well and good from a physics perspective, but what's important for us as structural engineers is that we like to break, we tend to like to break things down in terms of uh, Cartesian coordinates or rectangular coordinates. So our equations for static equilibrium then become, if we look at our equations of static equilibrium, they've got this little E, Q, and S here for equations. 
and we're going to have translational and rotational equations. We have our translational and rotational. Now, in a 2D system, we can have balance of forces about x and y. So the sum of forces in the x direction is 0, sum of forces in the y direction is equal to 0, and then in a 2D system, we would just have a summation of moments is also equal to 0. However, if we then look at a 3D system, we'll have summation of forces about the x, y, and z axis, or z axis, if we are of the British persuasion. Uh, possibly Australia and New Zealand and a whole bunch of other ones. Anyway, uh, we're in freedom land here, so we'll call it, we'll slowly use x. And then um, rotational, you will have not one axis to balance moments about, but three. So summation of four, uh, moments in the x direction, summation of moments in the y direction equals zero, and summation of moments in the z direction, or the z direction, uh, is equal to zero. And interestingly enough, when you if you are looking at a 2D system, you're technically using these two balances of balance of forces and the z or z balance of moment. If you again, because if you think about how where you're uh, taking moments about the the axis of a moment is the uh, is is the axis that something is twisting about or the moment is twisting about. So if you have a if you have, a, if you have like an x and y axis like this, if you have a moment like this. If you think about it, the moment axis is either coming into the board or coming out of the board. So the axis of a moment in normal, it's, it's, it, I always found this kind of interesting that the that when you sum moments, even in a 2D system, there's actually a, technically a bit of 3D work there because the axis that you're taking a moment about, even in a system on an XY plane, is technically a Z axis. Although in, our, uh, in the equations we'll typically use in this class, uh, in this video series, in this class, we're looking at we're going to look primarily at the two, at the cases of two D balance of forces and moments. So we'll just say the sum of forces in the x direction is equal to the summation of forces in the y direction is equal to just the balance of moments, no scrubs, no subscript, and all of these in turn must be equal to zero. Also, um, some other things. What these really represent is what these represent are equations that we can use to solve for certain unknowns. So um, it is a basic rule of mathematics, a basic principle of linear algebra, that as many, um, that generally, uh, if you have five unknowns, you're going to need five equations to solve for them, assuming there's some technicalities involved with that and some exceptions that you can learn linear algebra. But generally, in most real systems, if you have five unknowns, if there are five forces you're looking for, you're going to need five equations to solve for this. So uh, to, to determine them, you need five equations to find five unknowns. Or in this drawing here, actually, you would need, if we have four forces, we would actually need four equations. And we only have three equations of statics if we're dealing with a, uh, we're, we only have four equations of static equilibrium if we're dealing with a 2D case. So um, there, is, there are systems that are, um, that are in systems that have too many unknowns are referred to as statically indeterminate, and we will be looking at that in uh, later discussions. So let's now look at equilibrium, static equilibrium, and sections. Uh, static equilibrium and cuts slash sections. So static equilibrium in, uh, in cuts and sections. Now, we have seen already just in this video that the summation of forces and uh, moments on an object must come to zero. Everything must be in balance. But there is also a very subtle variation of this that uh, for an object to be in equilibrium, uh, to exist in equilibrium, EQ for equilibrium, all of its components or pieces must also be in equilibrium. So what do I mean by this? Well, let's say you have a structure. 
and I'm gonna just look at, I'm only gonna look at some of the internal forces that would exist when we cut this. I, I am abbreviating for the sake of, I'm, like, I'm gonna ignore some of the internal forces for the sake of brevity. But for example, okay, so let's say that there is a, there's a couple forces on here. Oh, I don't know, force F, maybe another force F, all sorts of forces. In turn, this will generate some reactions at the base of the structure. So maybe I'll say like there's an RAX, or maybe actually to be consistent with my prior notation, I'll just use AX. So let's say I'm gonna call this point A and B. Let's say there's reaction AX, reaction AY, and then some moment at A. This, let's say this is a fixed connection like so. And then let's say there's a BX, a BY, and then also a moment at B. And in case you're thinking to what we just talked about, in case you're making a connection to what, you're, what we just talked about uh, when talking about the number of equations and unknowns, this would be an example of a statically indeterminate system. If we're looking at just a 2D case, we have only three equations of equilibrium. We have uh, six unknown, uh, assuming we knew F, uh, uh, let's call this for consistency, maybe F1 and F2. Um, if we knew F1 and F2 and their angles, etc., um, if we tried to solve for the reactions using just statics, we would not be able to do that, simply because we have six unknowns and only three equations of equilibrium, but that's neither here nor there. Okay, so the point of this is to, that I'm trying to illustrate is that in order for an object to be in equilibrium, each piece of it must be in equilibrium. So imagine I were to cut out this little piece here. If I cut out that column, what I'll end up doing is revealing certain end forces. Uh, what we refer to as end forces, and we'll discuss this more later in the course, but you'd have some sort of axial forces, you'd have some sort of, uh, you'd have some sort of reaction forces, or sorry, uh, shear forces, and you'd have some sort of end moments as well. Um, but in turn, if I were to do a balance, if I were to do an, a, a summation of equilibrium on this particular piece, if I knew all of those, uh, I would find that all of those sum to zero. The moments would sum to zero, uh, the uh, translational forces in the x direction would equal to zero, and the translational forces in the y direction would equal to zero. Imagine I were to cut out this particular corner here, where this column meets this beam. If I did that, I would have a corner, I would have a force F applied to it, or F2 I suppose I labeled it, and then I would have some other internal forces. I would have a shear, I would have an axial force, and I would have a moment. I would have, I guess this would be an axial force the way I drew it. There would be an axial force, a shear, and also a moment there. I'm being a bit lazy with the direction I'm labeling them, we haven't gotten to formal we haven't really gotten into formal break into a formal labeling and breakdown of end, of end and internal forces. We will get there uh, later in the course. Right now, I'm just illustrating the concept of uh, equilibrium of sections. This is sometimes referred to as the method of sections, although particular this is particularly famous when looking at trusses, and we'll be looking at it when we get to trusses later on. But anyway, the important thing uh, for this portion of the lecture is that it is important to realize that for a structure to be to be in equilibrium each and every one of its pieces, no matter how you cut them, no matter how you separate them, must also be in equilibrium. So for example, if also for example, looking at this support here, imagine I were to cut out just this support and look at that as an isolated object. Well, I would have the support, the little bit of column and at the, uh, down to the ground, and there would be some sort of end forces on, or my, my reactions, I should say, BX, by and my mb reaction and then on this end i would have a shear an axial force and a moment and there would be certain equations and uh, uh certain equations and properties that we'll look at later again but the point being that if i looked at this piece just right here if i did a summation of moments on it if i did a summation of forces in the x direction or a summation of forces in the y direction if this entire structure is going to be in equilibrium, this piece has to be in equilibrium. 
If this piece is, isn't in equilibrium, the whole structure cannot be in equilibrium. If any piece of a structure is not in equilibrium, then the whole thing is not in equilibrium. And in turn, if an entire structure is in equilibrium, each and every piece of it must also be in equilibrium uh, as a balance between external forces and internal forces. So now let us look at an example of applying static equilibrium uh, to find the reactions of a simple frame. And I'm, I've designed this example uh, in a way that we can demonstrate that um, we can take rigid body equilibrium of any, either an entire structure or simply single components of it. So let's say we have a structure, a, a simple, a very simple frame, kind of like this. And the, this, of course, will not be to scale. So let's say we have a, a rod with two pinned ends, and then we have a pin support here. So we have a pin support there, and then and this is at an angle, and that's going to be at a um, slope of five to twelve. And then let's say we have a another rod, a horizontal one, and there's a pin support on this end as well. And let's just say there's a pin there and a support there, but it's a pin support. Okay, then dimensions. Let's put some dimensions on this. And it's going to be five feet wide. This one's going to be 10 feet long. And let's say we have a horizontal distance of 12 feet. Then in terms of uh, point labels, let's label, I'm going to label this A, B, and C. Super creative, I know. <laughs> and then I will apply a single force, a perfectly downward vertical force of 18 kips. So all this is given. And I want to find the reaction forces. Now, if we think about this for a moment, we're going to have a slight problem with trying to directly find the reaction forces. And that is, if we look at, think about what these supports are. These are two pin supports, pin A and pin B, or P, pin A and pin C. And so if we consider this entire thing as a single rigid body, um, that, that will work and that will be useful. But the problem again is we gotta think about the number of reactions. This uh, pin will have an X force and a Y force on it. This pin, uh, this pin A, the pin support A, will, have, will also have uh, two forces on it, two reactions, an X force and a Y force. Also, I can very quickly uh, remember my special triangles and a uh, 312, 13 would be uh, the slope of that triangle if we need it. All right, so um, we are going to see that there are cases where you can still do, uh, there are cases where you, uh, problem, there are problems and cases where uh, sometimes it's beneficial to take equilibrium about the entire frame, and sometimes it's going to be, it's going to be, to be beneficial about summing, and, uh, summing uh, equilibrium about a single component of a structure. And to solve this particular problem, we are going to use uh, both of these. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is draw uh, two free body diagrams. And these two free body diagrams will show, I'll have one free body diagram for the entire structure as a single object, a single rigid body. And I'll have another free body diagram showing uh, the frame broken into two elements. And instead of drawing these uh, rods, these poorly drawn, <laughs> these poorly rendered rods, I'm simply going to draw line elements for this. So first, let me draw a, a, a rigid or a free body diagram treating the entire frame as a single rigid body. So let's say entire frame, free body diagram. And I'm going to be a bit lazy and not show the uh, all of the dimensions on my free body diagram. If I wanted to be very proper, I probably should. So I have my uh, my frame. As, two, as showing its two elements, its two rods. And furthermore, notice I'm not drawing any of the pins, any of the internal pins or external support pins. I'm just treating this as a single object and I'm going to just show the forces uh, applied to it. Now let's say there is a, I have my downward force here of 18 kips and I'll also have my reaction forces, CX and CY. And then at uh, support A or joint A, 
I'll have my reaction forces AX and AY. So now I know that I know full well that this object is not a true rigid body. It obviously can't be. There's a pin in it. There's a pin right here. If I could, you know, if I took a saw and cut out this part and cut out this part, I could bend this back and forth really easily. There's literally a pin in there. So that means it's not going to be able to transfer all of the full set of forces through it. It's only going to be able to transfer x force and y force or two translational directions, which is what we'll see uh, in the next free body diagram. So again, the first thing I did was bought was uh, create a free body diagram uh, based on the, uh, the treating the entire frame as a single rigid body. Next, I want to draw uh, I want to draw the same uh, structure, except in what I would refer to as exploded view. I want to show the structure as its separate elements, and every time I'm going to cut the, uh, a, a frame or an object into pieces, I need to show the I need to show the uh, I in turn need to show the forces that transfer through that cut. So I'm going to draw this as two separate objects. Now, let's go ahead and look at that. So in exploded view, I would have something like this. Not one uh, piece, but two. And on this, let's go back to the same colors for consistency. I will have, let's say, on this piece, I'll have a CX and a CY. I'll have CX like this and a CY, not to scale, of course. Then I'll have my AX and my AY over here. And then I need to think about what kind of forces are transferred through this joint here. If these were simply rigidly, uh, rigidly attached, I would say that there is a, an X force, a Y force, and a moment transferred through this joint. But because this is a pin, it's only going to transfer forces in, tra in the two translational directions. If I try to transfer a moment through this, it's just going to rotate freely. So um, only an X force and a Y force will transfer through this joint. Now, in terms of direction, I need to, I need to make some assumption about the direction here. I can assume this one goes like, I'm going to go ahead and assume this one on this piece, on, the piece, uh, on rod AB. I'm going to assume that BX is in this direction and BY is in this direction. Again, BX and BY simply uh, represent the internal forces or the reactions spread between uh, rod AB and rod BC. Now, here's the crucial thing. Here's the crucial thing. I can assume whatever direction I want for these forces. I can assume BY goes downward. I can assume BX goes to, goes to the left. I can assume whatever directions I want, but it is imperative that I assume, make a compatible assumption on the other piece. In other words, and this is where really this is where we start seeing again the idea that uh, if an object is to be in equilibrium, each component of it must be in equilibrium. If I assume this BX acting on uh, rod AB is to the right, then the same BX acting on rod B uh, C has to be to the left. If BY, if I assume BY here is acting upward, BY has to act downward here. I can assume either one I want. I can, if I have BY going down here, I can, I would end up having a BY going up here. You can make whatever assumption you want, but it is imperative that you make compatible assumptions. Um, and by compatible, I mean uh, obeying Newton's laws of motion. Remember, for, uh, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. If this force is going to the right, then this force is going to the left. If BX on this element is to the right, BX on this element must be to the left. These, uh, this is what I mean by compatible, um, by compatibility in terms of equilibrium. If a structure is going to be in equilibrium, each and every piece of it must be in equilibrium and fully obeying all of Newton's laws of motion. Okay, and as a reminder again, I'm not drawing any moment here because this is a pin joining the two elements together. Also, we need to have this 18 kip force. I need to account for that. Now, because we're drawing these as elements, um, there's a couple ways you can uh, create these type of diagrams. I could treat, I could uh, cut out the pin and treat that as a single piece. That'd be one way to do it. But I'm since I'm just looking at the elements here, the since so I'm, so I'm just looking at the rods here, not the pin. Um, I need to put that 18 kip force somewhere, and I don't want to duplicate it. I don't want to put an 18 kip force here 
and an 18 kip force here, I instead I'm just going to put a single 18 kip force on this. Otherwise, I'll be double counting it. And um, <laughs> so essentially, if you're applying an external force at a joint like this one, uh, and you're breaking things into two uh, separate pieces, you want to make sure any external force applied at the joint only appears once. Otherwise, you're going to get inconsistent results and you won't end up happy. So again, uh, one instance of any external force, even on an exploded view. Okay, and of course, so the key takeaways again: one instance of an exp uh, one instance and only one instance of any external forces on the exploded view, and make sure all of your directions, all of your assumed directions, are compatible. You can assume whatever direction you want, but they have to be compatible. Okay, so now now that I have my free body diagrams, I'm gonna go ahead and just do a series of. I'm just going to go ahead and do a series of summations and balance of forces, balance of moments to solve for our unknowns here. So the first thing I'm going to do is take a summation of moments, or actually the first thing I'm going to do is consider one member here. I'm going to label it this way. So let's look just initially at member BC. Again. I can, there's many ways to solve this problem, but um, there are many ways to solve this problem, but uh, I can apply equilibrium again to the entire object or any piece of this object. So I can do a summation of moments about this free body diagram. I can do ones about this free body diagram, or I can do one about a summation of forces and moments about this free body diagram. I have drawn three free body diagrams and any, and any one of them uh, can be used if it is useful. Okay, now there is no free lunch. Uh, generally, if you have a, um, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Generally, if you cut, just make a cut in a rigid frame or something, you don't actually get enough. Um, you don't, yes, you get three more equations of equilibrium from the separate free bodies, but you also tend to create uh, three additional um, unknown forces. However, because we have a pin in this case, uh, that will only induce two unknowns. So if you have a pin, then you get three extra equations, but uh, only two more unknowns. So it can be, bene can be beneficial to do what we're doing here. Anyway, it's getting a little too deep into the theory. I'm looking for now just at member BC. So let's consider just member BC. And the first thing I'm going to do is take a summation of moments about point B. And something very special happens when we do this. So this piece here is 10 feet long. And there's a very particular reason I chose to take summation of moments of just member BC, not this member here or the entire frame. I'm looking at just member BC and I'm taking the summation of moments about point B. Something very special happens. Look at this, the 18 kip force, the BY and the, BY, uh, the BX and the CX, none of them generate a moment about that point. All, all of those forces, the 18 kip force, the BX force, the BY force, and the CX force, all of them have lines of action that pass through point B. So none of them are going to generate a moment about point B. In fact, the only force that has a actual non-zero moment arm about point B is CY. And its moment arm length is 10 feet. And it would tend to generate a counterclockwise or positive moment about point B. And this is in static equilibrium, so this is going to equal zero. And in turn, the only way to make this equation balanced is to cancel out the 10 and say that CY is equal to zero. So just right off the bat, I've already determined one of my reactions. All right, so we have this, this is equal to zero. Now I'm going to do a summation of forces in the Y direction, again, just looking at member BC. So let's do a summation of forces in the Y direction. Uh, and now, I have my negative, my downward force of 18 kips, my external force of negative 18 kips, and I have BX and BX, or sorry, not BX, uh, BY here. Um, so I have a negative 18, that's a really bad written K, it's even bad for me, <laughs> negative 18 kips. And then um, we have BY pointed downward, and so it's pointed in the downward direction, so I'll write this as negative BY. And all of this has to sum to zero. And in turn, if I solve for by, I will find that by is equal to negative 18 kips. If I know how to perform algebra, I find that by is equal to negative 18 kips. So just with this one free body diagram, we have determined 
uh, two of our unknowns out of our total of six unknowns. Ultimately, our goal was to find uh, just their reactions, but as we're going through this, we'll go ahead and find the internal forces BX and BY as well. Okay, so now uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, let's see, we're going to, I'm going to leave this here, but I'm going to uh, erase this through body diagram. Well, actually, mm -hmm, either here or there, but let's see, you could do it either or. Um, let me just modify this one. Let me just modify this a bit. So I'm going to say that CY is equal to zero, because the next thing I want to do is I want to consider a, free, a balance of forces and moments about the entire uh, body, the entire frame, instead of just one piece, because that's going to be useful as we're, I found when I was working through this, so that ended up being useful. Although, of course, there's infinite number of ways, or there's many ways to solve this problem, uh, like any problem. And then, uh, so we know that we have a downward force of 18 kips, and we know that CY is equal to zero. So this is what we know so far. So if I know that this is equal to zero, if I know that CY is equal to zero, I can do a summation of forces in the X direction. And again, I'm doing this on the entire frame. Maybe I'll write EF here to show that I'm taking, um, that this little section here is on the entire frame. I'm gonna do a summation of forces on the entire frame. Right over there, right again, right over there, we were working on uh, looking at equilibrium of just member PC, and now we're going to look at equilibrium about the entire frame. And so if I do the entire frame, a summation of forces in the X direction, or sorry, I should, I was, I'm gonna do in the Y direction, sorry about that. Summation of forces in the Y direction, I have negative 18 kips, and there is a CY is equal to zero, so there's no CY there plus AY is equal to zero, and therefore AY is equal to 18 kips uh, positive. Is equal to positive 18 kips or 18 kips upward. And I'm uh, trying to make, I'm trying to fit as much of this on this board as possible, so I am gonna try to use all the space as I can. Now, also looking at the entire frame, I'll just write EF again for the entire frame for this section, I'm going to do a summation of moments uh, about point A now. So I'm gonna do a summation of moments about point A for this entire frame. Look at this entire frame, and I'm going to take the summation of moments about point A. Now, neither AX or AY will generate any moment about point A because it has a moment arm length of zero. CY will not generate any moment about point A because it has no magnitude. There is no force on uh, CY, CY is zero. And so it has a non-zero moment arm, but it has zero magnitude force. Now I'll, I'll go ahead and, so the only things that will generate moment are the 18 kip downward force, the external force here, and the, uh, in turn, the CX force over here. So I'm gonna do a summation of moments about point A, and I have a negative 18 kips, and negative 18 kips times the moment arm length of five feet. And that does not, earth, again, think to your balance of moments. This is not generating a negative moment because it's pointing downward. I'm taking the summation of moments about point A, and this force tends to create clockwise rotation about point A. That is why that negative is there. A, a downward force or a negative force can generate a positive or a negative moment. A positive force can generate a positive or a negative moment. What matters is the relation of the force's direction to the point of rotation. And so we're taking the summation of moments about point A for the 18 kip force. That is a clockwise tendency to rotate. So therefore we have a negative sign on the moment in our moments balance in our moment balance equation. And then so we have negative 18 kips times the moment arm length of five feet minus CX. And looking at this entire free body diagram, or the free body diagram of the entire frame we can again see that CX uh, will tend to create, we can see that CX as well will tend to create a negative or clockwise moment about point A. If you're having difficulty seeing that, imagine taking this force here and projecting it back to, to the point where it's closest to point A. And then you can see that it will simply rotate uh, clockwise or uh, in, the, in, the, in the negative direction about point A. So negative CX, again, negative, not because of the direction it's pointing. In fact, CX here is actually pointing in the positive X direction, assuming X is to the right. So it's not negative because CX is positive or negative, it's negative because 
it is a clockwise rotation about point A. And then the moment arm length for any force, uh, horizontal force at point C, the moment arm length is going to be 12 feet, like so. And we are in static equilibrium, so all of this must, must sum to zero. And if I did the algebra correctly, I get that Cx is equal to negative 7.5 feet. Cx is equal to negative 7.5 feet. And in turn, I know Cx, and then all the other forces on this diagram are vertical. So I know this is, or not negative 7.5 feet, sorry about that, negative 7.5 kips. Forces shouldn't be in feet, they should be in force, like kips or pounds or kilonewtons. Um, so that is negative 7.5 kips. And again, looking still at the entire frame, um, if I know that's, if I know the magnitude of Cx, all the other forces here are purely vertical. So I can simply do a summation of forces in the x direction. And if I do that, set that equal to zero, I have Ax, well, summation of forces on, again, the entire frame equals to zero. That's going to be equal to Ax plus Cx. Now, notice what I'm doing in my equation. I know that Cx is negative, or in other words, I know it's going to actually point to the left, not the right, but I tend to create my equation, I like to create my equations of equilibrium based on how I drew them in my original diagram. If I do end up reversing the force, I mean, often I'll just end up reporting the forces and it's negative, and that's fine. Um, and most structural analysis programs will do that as well, software and such. Um, but if I ever want to show them in their correct directions, their actual uh, reverse directions, I do that at the end uh, when I'm done solving everything. So for now, um, I'm just going to do, uh, that, that, that really helps you uh, keep it from getting mixed up and turned and twisted around. I highly recommend when you're, when you're doing a, a system with a complex system like this, and this, is relative, and this is relatively tame compared to some of the things we'll be looking at later. Um, so I highly recommend um, drawing your free body diagrams and then simply working through all of the math, setting up all of your equations according to your free body diagrams. Don't actually go and reverse anything until the end, and we're gonna do that. And if I go, and so all this equals zero, I know Cx is negative 7.5 kips. And if I did my math correctly, I get, oh, well, actually that's very simple. I find that Ax is equal to positive 7.5 kips. So Ax is equal to positive 7.5 kips. So I know Cx, I know Ax, I know, Oh, let's see, we know Ay and Cy. All that's left is to, uh, and let's see, let's get our internal forces. We know By. So really all that's left here is to find uh, Bx. And to do that, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to leave my free body diagrams up, but I am going to clear the, uh, clear the writing. All right, so next let's look at equilibrium, um, again of piece or of rod BC. We see here. And the reason I'm going back to that one is that I now have CX, so I can just uh, look back at member BC in order to find uh, the, the last unknown force, which is BX. We found AX and AY, we found BY, we found CY. All that remains is uh, unknown force BX. And so just with member BC, I'm gonna go ahead and do a summation. I'm just, the simplest way to do this is just going to be a simple summation of forces in the x-direction and I will have, uh, let's see, I'll have negative bx. I'm going to, again, I'm going to look back at my original free body diagram that I drew and say this one is pointing to the left, so I'm going to put a negative bx. And then cx is to the right, it's positive, so plus cx. And all of these must, uh, must sum to zero because we're assuming static equilibrium. And I do know cx. Uh, I know cx is Oh, actually, let's go ahead and solve for Bx really quickly here. In terms of Cx, that's going to be very simple. Just move the Cx over, um, subtract two Cx from both sides, divide by negative one, and you'll get very simply that Bx is equal to Cx. And we already know Cx is equal to negative 7.5 kips. So simply negative 7.5 kips. And we now have all of our both internal and external uh, forces or unknowns uh, that we were looking for. So, uh, finally, I'm going to draw another exploded view uh, free body diagram and show all of the internal and external forces on it, uh, this time shown in their correct orientations. 
uh, the directions they're actually facing. Now, this step is somewhat optional. I just wanted to uh, include this for the sake of completion. So I'll go ahead and do that. And I'm gonna, again, I'm doing this as a, an exploded view. So I have my, uh, I have rod AB and rod BC. This again is referred to as a single rigid body. This would be, or, or actually in this context of how we refer to this as a global free body diagram. And this is a local free body diagram or a free body diagram in exploded view. Okay, so forces. Uh, I have my external force, 18 kips. That was, that was one of the forces that was given. Then I found uh, BX and BY. And originally I assumed BX was going to the right, but in fact, it's actually going to the left here on this one because it's negative. So on member AB, it would be going to the, uh, to the left. I assumed to the right, it's negative, it must actually be going to the left. So that then is 7.5 kips, a 7.5 kip horizontal force to the left on member AB. Then on member BC, the, sa the same force must exist, but equal and opposite, 7.5 kips. Uh, then I have a, a vertical force transferring uh, through the pin on this uh, rod, and it's an upward force BY of 18 kips. And then because it's pointing upward on this, uh, on this uh, piece, it must be acting downward on this piece. Uh, I'll leave the labels off, that's just 18 kips downward. And then in terms of reactions at A, I have a force to the right of 7.5 kips, which is the direction I initially assumed, and I have an upward force of 18 kips. And then uh, at NC, I have no vertical reaction force, or I did, but it sums to zero, or it came to zero. And I simply have a force, a horizontal force to the left of 7.5 kips. And this exploded free body diagram now shows all of the external and internal forces necessary to keep this structure in equilibrium. Note, I need a certain balance of both internal and external forces to keep this in equilibrium. But interestingly enough, imagine if we look at just, imagine we were to consider both the, uh, or to consider another global free body diagram. Let's say I have, let's look at, let's ignore the internal forces and look at just the external forces. In reality, I have this 7.5 kip this, uh, force this way to the left, uh, 7.5 kips to the left here, Very badly rendered K. And then we have a, let me just fix that, that doesn't look very good. So we have a 7.5 kip force to the left, and here we have a 7.5 kip force to the right. I have an external force of 18 kips here, pointed downward, and we found that our reaction here is 18 kips, and we found that there was no vertical reaction at point C. And look, this is an equilibrium. This force is balancing this force, and the two vertical, the, the external vertical force of 18 kips is balanced by the reaction at A, the upward reaction at A of 18 kips. So we see that the um, that equilibrium is maintained both looking at individual components and the entire structure. And this is actually a good way to do it to check a lot of your work when you're working with a slightly complicated system like this. You can always go back and uh, re relabel everything, put them in their correct actual directions, and see if equilibrium still holds true. If again, there's uh, if something's going to be in equilibrium, it's the entire object must be in equilibrium, and each op individual sub piece or component must also be in equilibrium. Anyway, that concludes our video here on looking at uh, static equilibrium, both equilibrium of individual components and equilibrium of entire structures. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Um, if you have any comments, uh, critique, whatever, feel free to leave that as well. Um, anyway, so if you have any questions, leave them below. I hope you found this video enjoyable, uh, interesting, or at least a little bit uh, educational or informative. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know below. Um, and if, if not, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe to make the wonderful robots of the world happy. If not, regardless, I will see you again soon in the next video in this series. I will see you all then, and as always, thank you.